Hello and welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome in Steeler defensive end, three-time Super Bowl champion, number 76, John Banizak. Banny, how are you? Great to see you. Great to see you, Stan. I'm doing fine. I'm surviving the COVID and uh, hopefully everything is fine with you also. Absolutely. Um, we're speaking to you from Heinz Field. Um, Steelers, of course, with all those Super Bowl trophies. But I want to get to your individual story, John. Uh, you took a rather unusual path. Uh, most guys go to high school, they go to college, and then if they're fortunate, they come to the pros. Uh, but you did your military service before you ever started playing college football. I did. Um, I really wasn't uh, a uh, very sought after high school football player. I was uh, six foot four, 180 pounds. And um, the only uh, offer that I got was from Kent State University, but it was a, a walk-on uh, um, offer. And, you know, I came from a large Polish family my, with eight children. My, we had six boys, I had six brothers and a sister. And my dad and family could not afford to send me to, to college. So uh, my dad and I, uh, and, and as my two older brothers did, they both went in the Navy, and that was a four-year uh, commitment on, on on their part. And uh, I found out that the Marine Corps offered a two-year enlistment uh, with full VA benefits after you were done. Um, so that's the route I chose. And uh, while I was in the Marine Corps, I was fortunate enough not to go to Vietnam. And um, I was stateside, and, and um, I took classes, classes from East Carolina University, and uh, knowing that I was going to go to school. And um, um, in two years, I went from a 180-pound kid to a 230-pound kid. And it wasn't because of Marine Corps food. It was just that my body um, developed and, and matured in those two in that two year period. So I contacted the coach that recruited me to Kent State, did moved over to Eastern Michigan. And um, Coach Coso, I, I wrote him a letter, told him that I was getting out of the Marine Corps on January 15, 1971. He invited me on that campus and um, as a walk on. And uh, but I had the GI Bill. And um, you know, that spring I won a scholarship, and uh, the rest is history. I'm wondering what was tougher, boot camp or your first Steeler training camp? I want to I want to get to that. Uh, so you play the three years at Eastern Michigan. How did you end up uh, in Pittsburgh? And we share that. A Clevelander coming to Pittsburgh oftentimes is a difficult transition, but seriously, I mean, how did you end up coming to the Steelers? Well, um, after my senior year, uh, it obviously entered the draft, and, and in 1975, there were 17 rounds in the draft, and there were like 475 players taken in, in, that, in that draft, and I wasn't one of them. Um, for whatever reason, and I've heard all the stories and all the reasons, I was not drafted. My age, I was a 25-year-old. Um, uh, rookie and um, and and some other things that you know anyway I was not drafted but immediately after the draft um, I contacted my attorney and he said uh, um, you know I, he didn't know what happened either we were projected between the fourth and the eighth round uh, but it didn't occur immediately after the draft uh, Tim Rooney and the Steelers called me. I had breakfast with the Steelers. I had lunch with the Lions. I had dinner with the Patriots, um, the Bills, and uh, the New York Jets also contacted me. So as a free agent, I got to choose what team that I would sign with. And uh, the Steelers were the defending Super Bowl champions. And I had never played on a championship football team. I was close in high school. We got beat by the great St. Ignatius teams, seven to six. Uh, we were nine and one. Um, 
you know, and when I went to Eastern Michigan, uh, we were making the move from the NAIA to to small college football and then to the MAC conference. Uh, so I really never played on a championship team. And I thought to myself, boy, if I make that Steeler team, uh, chances of winning a championship are pretty good. Uh, you know, disregarding the fact that I had to make that football team, okay, my goal was to to make that team and, and, and be a champion. Well, you know, it's interesting, John, you, you mentioned that because some might suggest, well, let me look at the path of least resistance. Um, a def not only a defending champion, but the core of that football team was the front four. And here you were trying to play the same position. Uh, clearly, there could have been teams where you had to figure your percentage of making the team might have been greater. Well, the one thing that I really thought was that, okay, so, you know, back then, we had seven preseason games that year, uh, which is amazing, but we did. We played the, you know, We went to training camp on July 10th, and we didn't break camp until the middle of September. Um, so my thinking was, if I can hang on, okay, um, with the Steelers until the, you know, second last or last cut, okay, maybe somebody will, that I, played against in the preseason um, and, and had a good game, maybe one of those teams would pick me up if I did uh, end up being cut. So that was my thinking of um, as, as that part of it. And yeah, I knew that the Steelers were a young football team. Uh, the number of uh, rookies they had the year before was unbelievable. They had like nine or 10, you know, uh, rookies that year that, uh, in 74. I knew the odds were against me, um, but I also knew I only had one chance, one shot at it, uh, because, you know, if, if it didn't happen, um, I, I wasn't like a number one draft choice that doesn't pan out with the team that drafts him. He's going to be picked up by somebody else, and, and probably two or three times. I only had one shot at it, and, um, and I was going to make the best of it. Fortunately for me, things worked out pretty well. And of course, you ended up being a part of the Steel Curtain a bit later on in your career. Uh, aside from the playing part of it, these four guys, those four guys, had been together a while now, uh, and they were a pretty close unit. And I wondered what it was like to be with those guys, talking about you know Joe and Dwight and LC and Fats Holmes. I mean, what was, I mean, how did they treat you? What was it like being around those guys, you know, in the same meeting room, the same area of the practice field? Well, that, it, it, it really was amazing, okay? Um, but I'm going to go back to the first meeting that we had in Latrobe with the rookies and, and the second-year guys. And that first meeting with George Perlis, he laid it all out on the line. And number one, um, the NFL contract that year was going to cut the uh, roster from 47 players to 42 or 43, something like that, um, which meant that they were going to have to they were going to have to cut two of the defensive linemen. They had seven um, defensive linemen uh, in 1974. So in 75, they were going to only keep six. And in order for me to make that team, I had to beat out one or, or, or two of the other guys that had already been there a year. Well, George Perlitz came into that meeting and he said, look at, he said, number one, you rookies, you can forget about playing. Okay. None of, none of you guys are good enough to, uh, to beat out Joe Green, Ernie Holmes, Dwight Wyatt, or L.C. Greenwood. He said, the, the defensive linemen that make this team also have to make this team because of special teams. In my rookie year, I was 230 pounds. And I could still run at 230 pounds. And I knew that after that meeting that George opened the door for me. Because if I could play special teams, if I could show them that I could, I could run under a kickoff and a punt, block on punt return and kickoff returns, I got a good chance of making that football team. 
and that was my goal is to just to make that team and be a special teams player and I, I had a good um, training camp and and got had an opportunity to play on all the special teams and um, and that's the reason why I made that football team was because I could play those special teams that's the way now, it is, certainly, with a lot of young guys coming in, even on a loaded team. So your rookie year, you're a Super Bowl champion. Um, I, I want to get to the next year. There, you know, obviously, with six Super Bowls, John, people say, well, what was the best of that? You know, it, it's really hard, different eras, that kind of thing. I mean, I have my favorite. Um, that was the 78 team. But a lot of people, including Dan Rooney, always thought the 76 team was the best team because of the record-shattering defense you guys played. And I'm wondering, did you get together after Terry Bradshaw was hurt in the one and four start and say, this is on us now, or did it just kind of evolve as time went on? Oh, you're exactly the way he was. I mean. Let me go circle back to one thing about about the steel curtain, those four guys. Once they saw that I could be a valuable part of that football team, they took me under their wings. And I learned so much just studying those four guys. My rookie year, I got an opportunity to play against the Houston Oilers because Dwight White was already hurt and, and Steve Furness replaced him. And um, in, the, in the middle of the second quarter, Elsie Greenwood goes down uh, um, with a knee injury. And that left me as the only available defensive lineman on the field. And I can remember George, uh, George Perlis got right in my face mask. And he said, you can't get blocked. You can't get reached. Oh, my God, isn't there somebody else I could put in the game? <laughs> And I'm looking around, I'm saying, no, George, I'm the only guy left. You got to put me in. So as I started running out on the field, he grabbed me and pulled me back. And he said, don't blow it. With that motivational message ringing in my helmet, I ran out onto the field. Okay. <clears throat> and, and I'm thinking, okay, he's right. This is my chance, my opportunity. And if I don't blow it, I proved to him and the rest of the NFL that I could play in that league. So I got in a huddle, I looked to, me, to my right, and there was me and Joe Green. I looked to my left, there's Jack Hamm. And in front of us, ready to call the defensive signal, okay, was Jack Lambert. And I thought to myself, how bad can I blow it? I'm surrounded <laughs> by three Hall of Famers here, okay? Very first play, I get a sack and I go off the field and then anyway, I got a game ball from my from my teammates for that game. So now into the second year, okay, same situation happens, and we ended up I ended up starting five games in my in, in my second year. And obviously I played well enough to to fill that position while the, the veteran guys um, got healthy, and we went on to have a tremendous, tremendous defensive year uh, with five shutouts. We went 22, 23 quarters without giving up a touchdown. Um, and, and I was part of that defense. Wow, Stan, it was, it was amazing what we did to people. One and four, okay, when we started out. Uh, that climb back into the playoff picture and that climb back into being able to get Bradshaw back um, and in those things. And it was, it was a tremendous year. Um, you know, you can talk all you want about the 1985 Chicago Bears, but what we did in 1976 was am amazing, amazing. The greatest stretch of defense in the history of the league, 28 points in nine games. You mentioned five shutouts, 9-0, and oh, and then, of course, the playoffs with the injuries to Rocky and Franco. But let, let's move on uh, sure. to, to my, I thought, the best all-around team ever 
was the 78 team. You were a starter by then. Um, uh, Chuck, because the rules changes, took the bridle or the reins, uh, loosened the reins on Terry with those wide receivers, you know, Swan, Starr, then, and Jimmy Smith, who should not be forgotten. Um, and that game against Dallas in Super Bowl 13, you had a tremendous game. But I don't know, if you, of the three Super Bowls that you were involved with, was that your favorite? Do you, do you recall that one more fondly than any of the others? Well, I, you know, obviously uh, being a rookie, uh, being one of three rookies to make a defending Super Bowl championship team was a, uh, was a feat in, it, in itself. Um, and, you know, I, I have a lot of great memories, of, uh, you know, about that game, Super Bowl X. Um, and then having started Super Bowl 13 and 14, um, you know, and, and having the game I had in Super Bowl 13 with a sack and a half and fumble recovery and, and all that, um, yeah, that, that was, you know, pretty special to me. It was a special game. It's uh, still regarded as one of the best Super Bowls um, you know, ever played. Uh, John, I'm wondering... Um, when play, player teammates, they bond, but it's especially so when you win championships together. And I'm wondering if you've been able to maintain a lot of those relationships with the guys you played with in the 70s. Oh, sure. I was just with Mel Blunt yesterday. Um, we both got our uh, vaccines uh, at the same time at Washington Hospital. You know, we're both Washington Hospital, Washington County residents and um, they invited us to down there. Um, we see an awful lot of each other. There's no question about it. I talked to Jack Ham and Mike Wagner um, on Monday. Um, you know, the guys that are still in in Pittsburgh area, um, we get together. Uh, while we haven't done very much golfing uh, in the past year, but, you know, as Mel and I talked yesterday, We've got to make that a priority this summer if, if the courses are opened up. And um, we have reunions, uh, obviously, uh, with, with, you know, I don't know whether or not we're going to have to continue to, to monitor the number of people that are in the stadium. Um, but, you know, the, it, it's good to see all those guys when they come back for, for um um, the reunions that the Steelers put on for us in our championship years. John, after your playing days were over, after the USFL, um, eventually you got into coaching, um, had a very successful career at W&J, um, making the playoffs all four years you were there, the national playoffs, um, uh, then to Robert Morris. Uh, I I'm wondering, did you always think about becoming a coach or – did being around Chuck Knoll and his staff perhaps plant the seed that you might like to get into coaching? It's probably a combination of both, Stan. Um, you know, I, I, I just uh, admired and, and the way that that, that staff coached um, all those great players. And, and, you know, even though there, there are nine Hall of Fame guys on that, that football team, um, my job as a special teams player early in my career was just as important as, you know, uh, Joe Green and Elsie Greenwood and Lambert and Ham and Blunt and all of the Hall of Famers. Um, and that was, um, you know, something that, you know, I, I got in my head early that, well, you know, coaching might, might not be a bad thing to do once I get out. Um, and, and, you know, I, I went into the business world uh, immediately after retiring, and, and that's when John Luckhart at Washington and Jefferson knocked on my door one day, and, um, and he said, uh, introduced himself, and he said, um, I, I said, well, that's nice to meet you, and he said, I'm just wondering if you could help me. I said, sure, you got a dead battery or a flat tire? <laughs> I can help you. He goes, no, I want you to help me coach. And um, I said, okay, uh, let's look at it. And, and, and I got 
started as a part-time guy and then eventually as a full-time coach uh, with him. And then, um, you know, as a head coach, at, and, and it really was a, a fulfilling career that I was able to play, um, you know, 24 years of, of, of football and then be able to coach for 30 years. Um, to, was an amazing run for me. Um, it really, the coaching, yeah, there was a lot of Chuck Knoll in me. Um, there was a lot of uh, Jim Stanley in me. Jim Stanley was our head coach with the Michigan Panthers. There's a lot of George Perlis in me. Um, I used what the, the best qualities and strengths that they had as coaches and applied it to my own style of, of coaching. Lastly, John, it's been said by many people who have played uh, for the Steeler organization that understanding it is a business, but with the Steelers, and you did experience different team in the USFL, but that the Steeler organization is like a family. Uh, and I wonder if you felt that way when you played and if you still feel that way, that you're a member of, of a large family. Oh, absolutely. I, um, the, you know, when you look back on it, and, um, you know, my rookie year, I was already married and, and uh, had my son in college. And, you know, we moved in here from, from Michigan and um, we were accepted as a family in, in that organization. Um, I can remember that, you know, the Steelers had a Christmas party. There were teams in the National Football League back then that nobody, they didn't have Christmas parties. And you don't find out about that until, until somebody else comes in or, or, or you, you move on to another organization. Um, but the Steelers certainly were a family-oriented uh, football team back then, and I'm sure that they are still, you know, today. Um, you know, um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it, it was an a, amazing, um, um, just a period of time that, that was um, quite, quite uh, an enjoyable um, seven years. Well, you gave a lot of thrills, uh, and I know you got a lot out of it. You also uh, offered a lot of thrills as individually and as part of a team to all members of Steelers Nation um, and the three Super Bowl championships and the character that you brought to that team, along with many others, uh, certainly rings true to this day. John, it was great catching up with you. Thanks so much. On behalf of all our uh, viewers and listeners in uh, Steelers Nation, it was really great to see you and, and hear from you once again. Well, thank you, Stan. I really appreciate the offer to do this and um, hope to see you soon. Absolutely. John Banaszak, three-time Super Bowl champion. Thanks, everyone.